Hi, this is Paul. A friend sent me a link to this video. It's a presentation given, obviously, at a web standards conference, and this woman clearly works in tech, and it's not about tech. You can see by the title of the speech, it all means nothing in the end. This video gives, I think, a very clear example of the meaning crisis and the state of let's say the religious cause a few videos ago i outlined three big religious causes i think it did in the, in the john stott on a bicycle video where there's the liberationist social justice there's the conservative social justice now i know some of you pushed back on that no because you're all um, nervous about the social justice word um, call it conservative ethics call it conservatism whatever you like it's, it's sort of the parallel to the liberationist social justice and then sort of the religious evangelical salvationist cause. Those are sort of the three, the three giant buckets of causes that are going on in our culture right now. And this is, this is quite a talk. And let's get into it. That making work completely me. <laughs> Give me a solid um, crisis. <laughs> She starts out with, you know, a few things about herself. She has a company called Frankly, and um, she goes into an existential crisis that she's having. Yay! I'm super fun at parties. Um, so historically, I have been somebody who has derived a lot of meaning from my work, and I have worked really hard. Like a complacent little cog in a capitalist machine, I have diligently reduced my identity to my professional endeavors. And now, a couple of things right there. Um, first of all, many people, especially many men and now women too, because of the, uh, because of the, mm, the feminist revolution, let's say that. Uh, women should be competing and superseding men in this space. So whereas men before derived a lot of their meaning from work, now women will derive their meaning from work. They won't derive their meaning from child, uh, from being a mother. You know, we can go into that all in the Barbie movie. I'm waiting for the Barbie movie. It's out streaming. I'm waiting for the price to come down a little bit. And then I want to do a much more in-depth look at the Barbie movie. But in other words, she says that her first, in a sense, her first cause, she got into the world of adulthood by being a worker. And she derived her meaning from her job. She derived her meaning from succeeding at her job. Now, let's again talk about meaning. Now, the recent Jordan Peterson video with Michaela offered a re some really nice summaries of what Jordan has been talking about, not just for the last six or seven years, but really since he's, he's written Maps of Meaning. And like many people, uh, this woman probably got into her career. People said, follow your passions. And so, oh, I'm interested in computers. I'm interested in technology. I'm interested in accessibility. I'm interested in, and so she got into her work and she found it very meaningful. And this is how meaning works. And something is going to glitter and gleam in the, in the periphery, capture your interest, right? And it's partly you, because it's you that's interesting, interested, but it's partly the world calling to you because you don't get to say what makes you interested, right? It, it sort of happens to you. Yeah. It's a yeah. synchronicity, like it's a place where the narrative and the objective touch. And so if you decide to go off your pathway and investigate what interests you, and you investigate it enough, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And if you go deep enough, you get on sacred ground. And that's where you're getting so deep that you're starting to study that which everything depends on. And then if you continue to study, you'll get right to the bottom of things itself. That's Moses' encounter with the divine. And if you do that, you will be a leader, right? And so that's, and so you say, well, and, and this woman, you know, basically followed the shining path of technology and she became a leader. And, and this was deeply meaningful for her. Right. And so that's and so you say, well, what guides you when you're lost? Well, the manifestation of intrinsic meaning guides you when you're lost. You can hear that in music, like music plays out the balance between chaos and order properly. Yeah. And yeah. it sort of tells you what is intrinsically meaningful and and uh, and and necessary and beautiful and true, all of that. And so and it's so cool because it works out neurologically, really, like it is the case that you advance developmentally on the edge of chaos, right? 
because you have to push yourself to advance. Yeah. That's what you do when you play. Like if, if you're playing one-on-one -on -one basketball with someone, you don't want to be six foot four and play with your like four foot two nephew and just stomp him to death. And you think, well, why not? Because you could beat the little bastard nonstop. It's like, I'm the victor. You don't want that, right? You want to find someone who can push you. Maybe you want to play with someone who's slightly better than you. Now, why? Because it's harder to win. And the answer is, well, the win means that you're developing. That's the meta win. And you, you obtain the meta win on the border of chaos. And that's all the place where the hero operates. And that's where you find the dragon and all of that. It's exactly the same thing. And meaning, the instinct of meaning signifies that developmental edge. And the, the constant mythological insistence is that God is to be found at the core of what makes itself manifest as meaning. And that's a definition, you know, and say, well, people think, well, you know, I don't believe in God. It's like, God, it, the belief in God is not adherence to a set of semantic propositions. That's just not how it works. It's not like, it's not like reading a set of descriptors and saying, I, you know, I, I concur. It's not that at all. It's being guided by, well, it's being guided by the spirit of truth. That's one way of thinking about it. Guided by the spirit of adventure. That's another way of thinking about it. And it, it's faith in meaning, it's faith in truth. Those aren't propositional ideas. And they, they, they fit the neurology perfectly because the instinct of meaning manifests itself on the edge of development. That's how your brain's set up. So if you're floating around in chaos because yeah. one of your belief systems failed. Okay, let's hold off on the belief systems failed stuff. So she, you know, followed her passions and got interested in tech and started doing this and became successful. And, and she talks about that. I'm going to try not to play. It's only 30 minutes, so it's not that long. She got interested in that and she got going. And then she had an existential crisis because these, these things, again, what the comment I made when I talked about that Jordan Peterson video is that this is fairly directionless at most levels. Oh, tech, that's interesting, I'll follow that. Oh, accessibility, that's cool, I'll follow that. And we'll dig into that a little bit more. All these things, that's cool, I'll follow it. But then you sort of get to a, you get to a floor. And I've made my work my entire personality. Oh goodness, what was, was that my hair? Maybe. Christ, sorry about that. Um, and anyway, yes, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my work. Work has provided me with meaning and purpose and something that I consistently felt motivated by, regardless of whatever was happening outside of work. So it was a bit of a curveball for me this year when, in about kind of April time, I found myself feeling a little bit out of sorts. Hmm. <laughs> so, as I finished up a two-year engagement with my last client, I realised I was in this kind of strange and unfamiliar territory. Um, and as I started thinking about what I was going to do next and who perhaps... I okay, so she's in the wilderness. ...I wanted to work with um, and, you know, thinking about what maybe I wanted to work on, I was struck by this really unnerving realisation. <clears throat> I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about design systems. I don't care about content design. I don't care about tech. I don't care about any of it anymore at all. I literally could not find a single shit to give. <laughs> I'm going to need your swear jar, I'm afraid, Dave. So no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't care about work. In other words, this isn't voluntary. This is something, as Peterson notes, that wells up from below. It used to be that tech was sort of the shiny thing that caught her interest. It was kind of the burning bush, and she went over there, and she devoted herself to it. And then she hits this point where it sort of bottoms out, and she doesn't care anymore. Um, as I mentioned before, I am... <laughs> <laughs> I am looking... And like you want to hire someone who no longer cares. ...for clients right now, so if you're up for it... Uh, let me know. Anyway, so I thought, okay, you know, I have been pretty flat out. I've been working quite hard for the last couple of years. So maybe I just need a break. So I decided I was going to take a couple of months. Okay, so maybe it's just physiological. Maybe it's biological. Maybe it's psychological. Off to recharge. So I took some trips. I went off to Paris. I drank wine with my best friend and I suffered the most luxurious hangover I think I've ever had in a fancy... And this is pretty much how Western people address the malaise that they hit, the blahs, the ennui, the meaning crisis, a personal meaning crisis at whatever level. The hotel. 
I went to Amsterdam, I got cataclysmically high, and I took <laughs> generic photos of bicycles propped up against railings. So in other words, she, uh, she tried drugs, she drank wine, she did all the things. Uh, I took days off to go to Instagrammable art installations here in London in an effort to try and reignite some creative energy. And at the end of it all... It's interesting that instinctively she went to art. Well, what, what is art? Well, art is sort of this portal to, let's keep it really vague, the transcendent now, or, or some transcendence, and we can you know, be a little careful about that. But, you know, so self-indulgence, psychedelics, art, she kind of hit all the things. Will all of this help her meaning crisis? Well, I still found myself here, <laughs> staring into the void, feeling completely uninspired and empty and lacking any motivation to get back to work. Now, if a minister was putting this together, they might say, well, then she found Jesus and now I am happy all the day. So this was starting to get quite serious. So I brought out the big guns. In an effort to try and understand where exactly this blockage was coming from, I started journaling. I wrote pages and pages of introspection and streams of consciousness and I made lists and I delved deep into my psyche to try and make sense of why I had hit this metaphorical brick wall. And as I journaled, I started to notice this theme on the pages, this persistent thought that kind of kept coming up over and over. When I thought about Now, if you do want to hear one where they find Jesus, Someone else sent me this, I didn't know any of these people at all, the Danny Miranda podcast number 404, David Perel, Surrender to Your True Nature, where he talks about him becoming a Christian. And in some ways, it's a very similar story to this one. It's just that he becomes a Christian and that's, you know, that's where he's at now. And she doesn't go there. About work, the overriding sentiment I had was, it all means nothing in the end. In the end, none of it really matters. Design she hits nihilism. Design systems or content design, tech, work, it's all just meaningless nonsense. Again, uh, with modern day Ecclesiastes here, except she's not a king and wealthy, she still needs a job. And just to mention <laughs> um, <laughs> that I am very much available for new clients right now. So hit me up. Uh, he's taking photos of this, and I'm like, don't put this on the internet. Anyway, so, um, but it is all just meaningless nonsense, isn't it? If we're being really honest, at some point in kind of 10 or 20... No, notice how she talks. We're all in agreement with this, right? We're all in agreement with this. In other words, all of you people out there taking notes at this wonderful conference about web design, really, we all know this is meaningless, right? We all know this, right? So she's she's trying to appeal. I mean, again, this is sort of the minister being, oh, it's Jesus, right? It's Jesus, right? It's meaningless, right? 20 or 100 years from now, no one's going to remember any of these things that we've said or done. So why actually bother? And this was quite the turn of events for me. As I said, I had been very... Now, you will hear the answer to that why I actually bother because a number of people will go into it. And the answer that they usually give is, no, because it feels meaningful to you right now. Oh, so, and that's not too far from Jordan's thing, because again, for Jordan, the, the sense of meaning, the experience of meaning is a gyroscope that's supposed to guide you further in and to guide you to the transcendence. And now there, there's a degree of truth to that, but, but that thing will guide people to all sorts of meaning in all sorts of ways. And... There'll be a lot of questions in terms of how deep they actually get, but she's at, um, you know, nihilism stage. Kind of motivated by my work. So I needed to take a few steps back and think about how I got here. How did I, somebody who was historically very career driven, get to this point of total disengagement? Okay, and when she describes how I, I, who was career driven, in other words, that should, that there's one of sort of the idols of the age. If you're career driven, that should be enough because you can meaning, if you meaningfully pursue this career, you know, just careful with the nihilism pitfalls and all of that. Just, just stay in the moment, stay with the meaning level of the career and, and you'll just be okay. But no, couldn't do it for one reason or another. Well, there's a few factors. 
So the first one is that I have been dealing with a series of personal events this year, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but which... Oh, there's the chaos of personal events, you know, might have been a romantic breakup, might have been a financial setback, might have been a familial crisis, might have been a health crisis. As a pastor, I know, because these are all the lists that, you know, when people come into church, it's usually because they've had some kind of crisis and they're looking for help. You've definitely contributed to this sense of kind of futility and insignificance around my career. So and, and of course, a lot of people will say, well, no, it's it's depression. It's a medical problem. It's the medical illness of depression that's causing nihilism. And I'm not saying that. I mean, practically, the definition of depression is meaninglessness. But go on. So with so much to navigate in my personal life, it's not really any wonder that my career has kind of fallen to the bottom of my priority list. And this has been especially tricky because in January 2020, I decided to leave my last permanent role and start contracting and consulting. So she had a job and, well, it's a little bit more chaos and order, a little bit more opportunity. If you're, if you're your own boss, so start your own consulting firm, start your own design firm. And so, you know, you're feeling hemmed in, so bigger. So maybe, maybe this will be the answer. So I set my own company, it's called Frankly Design, and I began working with external clients. And I will say on the whole, this has been a really good move and one that I'm super proud of. But it's definitely shifted things in terms of how I get a sense of my progress and how well I'm doing. I don't have a boss anymore. I don't have things like one-to-ones or performance reviews or salary bans or seniority levels to think about in the same way that I did when I was permanent. And I had underestimated, I guess, how much those things had provided a framework for me to get a sense of achievement and how. Okay, so actually, you have this meaning, you have this meaning gyroscope, and that's sort of where you're focused at. But actually, that's sort of an agent within an arena, and there's an, this arenic quality to meaning. And so, when you were say career driven and Jordan will talk about this very clearly, there's the goal right in front of you, there's the next step on the hierarchy, there's the next rung in the ladder. And as long as you have these things that you're always reaching towards, because actually once you achieve them, that, that whole meaning mode, that meaning motion thing and sort of, sort of is relieved. It's, it's always, it always feels more meaningful when you're reaching for something than actually when you grasp it. You, uh, there's a really good book by Susan Wolf called Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. Um, and, and, you know, when you what the metaphor people use is I want to feel connected to something larger than myself, something bigger than myself. And here's a way of seeing if you have this in your life and why it might have come into question like you were just talking about. Ask yourself, what do you want to exist even if you don't? And how much of a difference do you make to it now? Okay, so take me through an example of that. So now, now we're sort of jumping a level because we're going to get there with her. What's amazing about this talk is that all of the stuff we've been talking about in the meaning crisis, all the Jordan Peterson stuff, as when we she begins to describe herself a little while, she was likely someone who was already set up, let's say like Gavin Newsom's son, already set up to be against Jordan Peterson and anything adjacent to Jordan Peterson, like John Verveke or Paul Vanderclay or Jonathan Pichot, because we're all evil. But um, she's on this meaning thing. And now John Verveke is going to sort of flesh out that the gyroscope alone towards meaning is insufficient because that gyroscope actually works in connection. It's much more of a GPS or rather a... Um, an astroglade or something like that that measures according to the stars because you actually do this within a context and this is why she said well when I started working for myself you know what are the metrics now she could have looked at um, what's our how much money are we bringing in how much influence do we have how many clients do we have how many employees do we have it doesn't look like she sort of decided to be she wanted to be a designer who was self-employed rather than to build a design corporation that would take over the world so let me think, what do I want to exist? Even if you don't. Even if I don't exist? Yeah. Um, probably families. Yeah. So these are people. You want them to exist even if you don't? Yeah. Yeah. Like and happy children. Yes. Happy families, maybe. And again, you can see this in the Old Testament. You can look at Abraham. You know, Ab the Abraham was in many ways a loser in his day because he and Sarah had no children. 
And so then God comes to him and says, I'm going to make you the father of nations. This is like the biggest thing you can, the most meaningful offer you can give someone during the period of the patriarchs. It would be something I would say. And do you think you make much of a difference to them right now? Not a ton. Right. So you need a good answer for both of those to have a strong sense of meaning in life. Okay, so take me through an example of somebody that would have a good answer like that. What, what would be an answer that would probably leave somebody feeling fulfilled after they ask themselves this question? Well, I want to I want to point to something that you put your finger on. Uh, there's a decline in the bigger picture worldview, um, and it off, the worldviews that we we experience them, and I'm trying to use this term very broadly, religiously. So, I don't mean okay. And again, in this Amy Hube. Um, video, we will get to worldview. Just like Christianity mm -hmm. or Juda Judaism or something like that, but I also mean what used to be called American civil religion. Like the, you have their heroes and things are sacred like the flag and you pre pledge allegiance, which is a kind of prayer, right? Uh, and so, and both of those religious frameworks, and even though they're tearing each other apart about it right now, they're falling, right? And so people used to say they would die for their country. Mm -hmm. People did it in World War II. They, right, they want the U.S., the United States, to continue existing. They think the universe is a better place if the U.S. is in it, and they are making a difference. They're in, like, they're in Germany, and they're liberating the world from tyranny, and so they're making a real difference right, to this overarching worldview, American democracy, Americanism. Mm -hmm. They had Meaning in life. So much meaning in life that, like Socrates, they're willing to die for it. I mean, they must have. I mean, to think like, yes, I'm an, I mean, they had people that were ch lying to get into yes. the draft. Yes. Like, I want to go serve my country. I will die for my country. They believe that much in it. It feels like we're further from that now, for sure. So that, the idea of your country being that thing is probably less. Right. So that's the other poll now. Remember, we talked about the individual poll. Then there's the worldview, the the right, the the poll that we we no one pro, you didn't invent English, did mm -hmm. I? Right. It's these are the things we invent together and we evolve together and we participate in together. And one is like there was a great metaphor by a, a, an academic called Peter Berger. He called it the sacred canopy, where you had mm. this worldview that basically gave you uh, it told you how to be an agent in the world and it it made the world a meaningful arena so there was an agent arena relationship and they were attuned to each other so you knew what to do you knew how to fit in and and so you had this world view that grounded things and this is the bigger picture and then people could could connect their personal wisdom cultivation to this bigger thing and enhance their meaning in life and this mm. is what religions both civil and, you know, uh, religious, sorry, we don't have, we, we need another, sacred, I suppose. Civil and sacred religions, they were both doing for people. And these have been breaking down right. for a whole, so those are the historical factors. And when they break down, people's ability to find purpose and depth and clarity and mattering gets undermined and their self-deception exacerbates. Okay. Because, because they get isolated, like we were talking about in COVID. They get disconnected from a shared worldview that gives them these, these ecologies of practices. You can't do them on your own, right? You'll, you'll fall prey to sort of, you know, if you're just an autodidact, like a self-learner, you'll fall mm -hmm. prey to all your biases and all your egocentrisms and your unrealized comfort zones. You need other people to so, be. So we need each other to have meaning. You, yeah, we transcend each other through each other. Like, right. I tra okay, so. You got the picture. How well I was doing. So without them, I often feel as though I'm maybe drifting or even flatlining. How do I know if I'm progressing or what does a good year look like when I'm the only In other words, she needs an arena. She needs an arena in order to evaluate her progress because again, the progress is what's meaningful. Only one at my company Christmas party, which makes me <laughs> sound kind of sad. Um, and then there's the focus of my career itself. So for the past few years, my main focus has been on design systems. And sorry, I, I know there was a show of hands for this before, but is there anyone in the room that works on design systems? Okay, a few of you, yeah. So you will know that um, they can often feel like a real uphill struggle. Design systems.
Okay, now, of course, this whole image is, it's a never-ending push. In other words, there aren't these measures by which one can evaluate their progress. It's just a slog, and then as she said before, it's just a slog till you die. Systems involve a lot of organizational change, which means that we sometimes, for those of us working on them, feel like we're kind of constantly working again against the people and the organizations around us. And when we're successful, I think this work can be immensely gratifying, but we are not always successful. And even when we are, quite often the journey of getting there leaves us feeling quite burnt out and depleted. Okay, so successful means, again, meaning, Peterson's very clear on this, meaning is all about this reaching. Once you arrive, sort of the meaning sort of releases, and then you look for something else to reach for. And that's why even extremely successful people they just keep reaching. And if they achieve a lot of money, maybe they want political power, maybe they want influence in the culture, maybe it's a religious thing. To compound this, I don't know if you've noticed, but my God, the absolute state <laughs> of the tech industry right now. Okay, now here's something interesting because this reveals she already has metrics. She has a first draft. There's been, there's been a first draft and subsequent drafts that have built into her. She has a map of meaning, and she's looking around at the state of the tech industry and comparing it to this map of meaning that she has developed over the years that has been imprinted on her, probably not even consciously. She's just basically absorbed it from all of the social hierarchies around her. What is, you know, what is pushing people up the hierarchy? Well, that's important, that's value. So she's reading all the value and up it goes. <laughs> if the offensive lack of diversity the incessant bloviating about JavaScript frameworks, the willful ignorance about accessibility, thankfully not in this room, I don't think, but in general, ChatGPT and Elon Musk were not enough to make you want to crawl into a very dark deep. So anyway, so now she, what she's doing is she's setting out these, sometimes I talk about centered set and bounded set. She's putting down all these bounded markers that she believes in this room everyone will agree on. Everyone will, everyone will agree on diversity, the value of diversity. Everyone will agree on the value of inclusivity. Everyone will agree on that Elon Musk is a horrible person. Everyone will agree that ChatGPT is a terrible thing. Everybody, th this we all agree. So, okay, so she's, she's in an arena. She's in a value arena. And she's saying, hmm, things aren't going the way our value arena says they should go. Deep hole. We are now dealing with widespread layoffs. And on top of this, there is the small matter. Now, now, there's a little bit of irony in these layoffs because, wait a minute, you're the one that basically has probably made enough money via capitalism to not really have to work right now, even though the hire me thing is coming up. And of the fucking well being on fire. <laughs> the apocalypse, the end of the world. So between the pandemic and the climate crisis, rising and increasingly mainstream attacks on trans people, the war in Ukraine and the resulting threat of nuclear Armageddon, I think it's fair to say that the last few years have been, to borrow a quote from Succession, quite the shit show at the fuck factory. <laughs> So in other words, there is a worldview here and there are values and she might not sort of hold them up, but she says, this is sort of what we all agree on. I'll call this liberationist social justice as one of the grand causes, one of the big worldviews, one of the big implicit religions that are out there right now. And this point in particular is something that I know has altered the relative importance of work for a lot of us. So I'm sure lots of you remember this spate of articles back in 2022 and heated Twitter discussions around it about quiet quitting. So this apparent tidal wave of employees mentally checking out. So what's interesting is that, in fact, this worldview does scale up and the nihilism that she felt in terms of her first meaningful pursuit of career, her first adult meaningful pursuit of career, let's say the first one that sort of dominated a number of years of her life, now is threatened by the larger worldview in which there are catastrophes looming that are probably inevitable. So then, 
the workplace is no longer meaningful. And she looks around and says, hmm, worldview induced anxiety. So that's bad too. Viewing work with increasing cynicism and reducing their input to just the bare minimum required to keep their jobs. And we saw article after article talking about the end of ambition collectively. So this widespread change in our attitudes to work and this exponential trend in people rejecting the idea that our careers should be a source of fulfillment and purpose and choosing instead to concentrate on more meaningful things like our friends and our family and our hobbies. So her meaning crisis isn't alone, but now our friends and our hobbies and well, two generations ago, they would have said, well, your family, which is exactly what Theo Vaughn said if you caught that. How much would they miss you if you're gone? Oh, not a lot, he says. It's like, whoa. First of all, I'm skeptical. Second of all, if that's true, ooh. And our lives outside of work. And I'll say now that I do think that caring less about work is completely fine. Oh, we so now we have an ethic of nihilism. We have been served this idea for such a long time now that our careers are deserving of the absolute majority of our attention and our energy, our time, and should. I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was sold that way. I'm sure it was. You might say the Protestant work ethic, yada yada yada. But no, this was a meaningful pursuit that you went after because this little internal drive for meaning drove you that way until you began to reach sort of a leveling of sort of arenic arenic nihilism and your personal burnout nihilism and some personal crises sort of hit a point where it's like psh, forget it should be our main concern and we've been completely overfed this glamorized portrayal of hustle culture and i think many of us have just had enough and i absolutely think that that's okay but i also think that There's plenty of value judgments here there always are from a sermon making work completely meaningless is probably not going to make us happy either because the hard facts are that for most of us we still need to work for a significant proportion of a nine to five day at least four days a week to survive because capitalism oh because, so if we didn't have capitalism oh wait a minute weren't you the one that stepped out from your business and started your own business and this is, again, the, the real duplicity I hear about capitalism from people like her around me who have been reason. I, re I remember one woman who was a she was she was being fairly successful in her career, complaining about capitalism. And her her whole business was was completely based on capitalism. And it's like, OK, well, you got to lease a Mercedes this year because your business has done so well. Would you really like to just flatten out the, um, have everybody in the country live at the median um, personal income? Is, is that what you'd like to have on your W-2? And whether you're working 50, 60, 70 hours a week because you find it meaningful or whether you're staying home watching soap operas during the day, everyone get, you know, they usually don't think too far into this, but okay. And although I definitely don't want to dissuade anyone from starting a socialist revolution, I think that probably... Okay, well, we'll raid your bank account first, the one that you're living on now between gigs, because you probably have money saved away for a rainy day because you seem like a very intelligent, industrious, responsible human being who has probably done just fine. And so we'll take your money first. For most then again, she's in... Uh, I'll, I'll leave that alone of us here that feels a little bit unrealistic right now at least so what do we do about it right now at least so oh, someday in the future that will come um our prophet john lennon has announced it if we have to keep working how can we make work mean something okay so my religion a which was my work how can i reinvest my work with more meaning I did actually write these exact words, it all means nothing in the end, in my journal one day. And as I looked at them, something else started to emerge. Something to do with means and ends. And what I realised is that I had completely lost touch with my sense of purpose. 
and my work. Which... Ah, religion, but we're not going to call it that had once just been a vehicle for my values and the things that I actually cared about had become work for the sake of work. My career had once just been a means to an end, but it had now become the end itself. And it's perfectly understandable, again, because of sort of um, her first adult meaningful pursuit, this is what that little gyroscope of meaning will, will lead you to. It, it, it sort of promises an end. Maybe the end is the next paycheck or the next quarter or the next raise. Because again, just listen to Jordan Peterson about how meaning works. There it is. That's how meaning works. He mapped it all out. And that's the thing that I needed to change. So I realized I needed to take a step back and think about why I had started to work in this space. Now, notice the wording. Reconnecting to... Now, she could have had this in a number of different ways. Recon rediscovering or discovering or creating my purpose. She couldn't have done that. No, she didn't do that. Reconnecting to purpose. No, a purpose, the purpose. No, just purpose. And so you sort of make it religious. Reconnecting. In other words, purpose is out there already in the universe. She, her, If she, in fact, sort of has a nihilistic materialist universe in which uh, being is not positive, being is not negative, I hope, but being is neutral, then purpose, well, again, this is, you could look at Wilfred Sellers and I've talked about him quite a bit a few years ago. Um, for, the, for the secular worldview, there, the purpose has sort of been ripped out of the world. This is the scientistic lab leak that happens in the in the enlightenment purpose has been ripped out of the world so that we can manipulate it but now we have to go back looking for it because we don't have it it's another way of understanding what the meaning crisis is base in the first place so what was it about design systems and content design and tech in general that drew me in okay so now she wants to know what was really in that burning bush that drew me in and that i saw as a kind of an opportunity to make the kind of mark that i wanted to make in the world and so I saw, remember seeing, shining, I saw, and I, I felt it, I saw, what, what, originally, let's go back to, let's retrace my steps back to when I was, you know, 18 or 19 or 21 or, you know, in university, wherever, where I sort of had this, this vision of, of me and technology and, ooh, it'll be great. And as I was thinking about this, I remembered an exercise that I did as part of a coaching course a few years ago called the Courageous Leadership Programme. And it was run by Sarah Wetzer-Betcher, who some of you might be familiar with as the co-author of Design for Real Life and the author of Technically Wrong. Program cost $925. Next score hit begins 2024. Join the wait list. Wow. Successful Courageous Leadership Programme. And I want to make it very clear that I'm not being sponsored by Sarah to promote her books or her coaching services. Neither am I. Um, but I am a very hardcore fangirl and I would absolutely recommend engaging with her services. Um, I don't know anything about it, so I'm not going to recommend it, but there it is. And her work, because it's had a huge impact on how I think about my work. So in the course, Sarah talks about finding your core perspective, which she defines as the... Inter now, again, notice what Charles Taylor says, once in a sense we're put in the iron box of secularism where we can't see the stars anymore, now instead in the buffered self we no longer look out and up for our core purpose, we look down and in because out and up has been blotted out and blocked by the enlightenment. So now we have to look down and into the secret sacred self and we think, well this is the, this is the path to transcendence. In is the path to transcendence instead of up and out. The section of your skills, experiences and values. And it's the combination of these three factors together that give us our unique lens on the world. And so we have to look for something unique and so we're looking for, so you, you sort of employ combinatorial explosiveness in these three categories and where the lines all cross, that will be it. Usually inform the career path that we take. So for me, they look like this. The things that I'm good at are communication, working with other people, being perceptive of the needs of those around me and the people that I encounter through my work, being analytical, 
and I'm a good systems thinker, so I can see how different people and parts and processes connect to each other and to a bigger whole. In terms of my experiences, very early on in my career, I remember feeling completely bewildered by the uh, kind of corporate jargon that was being thrown around at the company that I worked for. And hearing these acronyms and these obscure project names and these very strange turns of phrase and sort of terminology uh, made me feel like I was less capable or knowledgeable than those around me. And when I finally did realise that it wasn't me and that this kind of language is just alienating by design, I became determined to rally against it for the remainder of my career. Okay, now this point is really key. She had a negative experience. What's really interesting is that just like looking for orientation, your negative experience can either drive you this way or drive you out. And in a sense, if you drive it this way, you get more depressed because, well, now the secret, sacred self, there's a problem down there. But if you drive it out, no, wait a minute, these are the systems. The systems are causing negative emotion in people. And so what I want to do is change the system so they no longer cause negative emotion. Now, this is not a bad thing. You know, let's say there was a, um, let's say there was a bus and the driver of the bus kept the heat on in the middle of the blazing California summer. It's not a bad thing to ask the driver to, why don't you turn off the heater and put on the air conditioner because California is hot in the summer. That's not a bad thing at all. But now notice it starts out this personal negative emotion then you look up at the system and now you want to change the system. Very meaningful. And in fact, whereas the career, a successful career, well, good numbers of people attain a successful career. The people that we look at who have changed systems in a big way, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, yada, 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 just, again, this is liberation of social justice world. Um, I want to join that pantheon of system changers. And just like I sort of worked my way up in my career, I'll work my way up in the system changing. Then, working in hospitality in my teens also meant that I got really good at building relationships and dealing with difficult customers. And okay, so I was, I was encouraged and approved and rewarded for some things. So not only did I have some negative experiences, I had some positive experiences. This has been immensely applicable to my work as a consultant. And then on top of that, I didn't really have the easiest childhood. So my parents separated when I was really young. Um, I ended up living with my dad and I was a pretty kind of anxious and quiet kid, which is quite hard to imagine now, I know. Um, and in secondary school, I was bullied quite badly for a period of time. And Okay, so bad experiences. And now again, I've I mentioned before, there's sort of these two, there's these two, um, There's these, there's these two modes that people have, hurt people, hurt people. So, well, you were bullied as a kid, surely you're going to uh, damage people. No, 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 it's those, who, it's those who have suffered that become the liberators because human beings, once they, once they experience the negative emotion, they say, not only do I need to escape and be liberated from my negative emotion, I want to liberate others from their negative emotion. And this is sort of the, what's at the core of the liberationist ethos. And, and again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a liberationist ethos. If, if the bus is too hot, turn on the air conditioner. If a kid is in a bad situation, try to make the situation better if you can. Um, people are trapped in terrible things and liberation can be a wonderful thing. Only question is, is it always quite that simple? Is it, is it probably one of the things that um, liberated me from probably a lot of the liberationism that was in me is when I became a missionary in the developing world and realized this liberation business is, is not so easy. Now, one might have hoped that I would have read the book of Exodus and figured that out because Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are all about the fact that uh, liberationism is by no means an easy thing. In fact, one could reasonably argue that 
at a certain level of analysis, the liberation of Israel from Egypt was kind of a failure because actually, especially if you're sort of an individualist, if you look at all the people as individuals, almost that entire generation, Moses included, never gets to the promised land. The children, Caleb and Joshua, are the ones who go into the promised land. Not Moses, not any of those people that lived in Egypt. It's their children that, you know, two years after the Exodus, and they get over and they're ready to go in and they send in the spies. And the spies are, you know, the spies are, don't want to go in. That's why they wind up 40 years in the desert to die in the desert. Wandering 40 years in the desert is a death sentence. That's what the book says. All of this made me really sensitive in the best way possible to the struggles that people face. And I felt like I was- Okay, empathy. There's a biggie for, for liberationist culture. To, to do something that would make a difference to the quality of people's lives. And these experiences informed my values. So I really care about inclusivity. And I believe that everyone has a right to access the information and services that they need and to participate in the spaces that they work in. I also try to champion and exhibit vulnerability. Is there something backed up there? This is what happens when you work on your slides in the morning of the conference. Um, <laughs> because I think that doing so connects us and it helps us to open up and bring our full selves to work. I also try to work hard to make things more equitable by shifting power from those who have far too much of it into the hands of those that find themselves systematic. Far too much of it? Oh, oh, oh. So we know who should have power. On, on what metric do we evaluate who should have what level of power? ...disempowered and discriminated against. I believe in transparency that as individuals and organizations, we should be honest and transparent about what we're doing and why. So I hope she doesn't mind me commenting on her video where she very vulnerably and transparently sort of opened up her life. And part of the reason I think the person sent me this video and part of the reason I use this video is because as a pastor, this is all very, very normal. This is all very, very common. This is, this is the most, one of the most widespread religions in a state like California that there is. And often I can't take people that I sort of know in real life and just hold them up and tell them their story. That's why it's so lovely when people go on YouTube and they just give it to us for free. And well, here it is. And again, you know, there's nothing wrong with these values. They're good values. The only question is, where ought these values to be on the hierarchy? Even the most conservative social justice people, or whatever term you want to use, even the most conservative people have some element of these values in their program. It all depends on where these values are in their hierarchy. And something that I want to add and acknowledge at this point is that all of this is underpinned by something else about me, which is that I have a lot of privilege. So I am a woman, which is not always a picnic, but I am also white, I'm financially secure, I'm educated, I'm still just about young enough to be considered relevant in tech, and <laughs> I am cis and I'm not disabled. Okay, so again, she's working in this arena and she just put down her bona fides and she just made her obligatory bowing before the altar that she must do. And so now that she's done this, now she can go on and tell us all how to live, even though, well, now remember she said that she was bullied in school and she has suffered. And on the basis of that suffering, she is she now understands Everybody else is suffering, even though she's privileged, so she can't really, I mean, I mean, you can, this little, this little trap right here is, it just goes on and on forever. And we've all seen, you know, they have this one circle of um, all these contradictory things that are sort of in wokeness, you know, you need to speak truth to power, but you need to be silent because you're privileged and it's just all these little Kafka traps in it. So, okay, so, so don't get triggered over this stuff too much. You've all seen it. You've seen a million videos on it. You know the whole thing. There it is. This is sort of liberationist social justice cause religion. That's what this is. And she just sort of nicely, winsomely laid it all out for us. And I have to acknowledge that because it is important. It's relevant. And I have to decide what I'm going to do with it. 
I even th though really to say how it's important or why it's important probably no one can but so say we all so from here i wrote a statement that brings all of this together and this is my core perspective as someone in a position of relative power and privilege who has experienced exclusion i want to champion inclusivity now remember buzzwords are holy words and this is full of buzzwords so this is in a sense her sacred text. I believe that people can bring value and make positive change when they are validated and empowered to participate. Now, there's a little bit of circularity in that second one, and it's extraordinarily vague, but there it is, because the, the, the bar for qualifying as people is pretty low. This, I believe, is my purpose. This is the end goal for me. This is what I actually care about and content. Okay, so now she's arrived at articulating her religion and this is what's going to help jumpstart the meaning. At design and design systems and the work that I do are just my current best means of achieving it. And I realized I needed to hold myself to this to find meaning in my work again. Now, there's a little difficulty. I need to hold myself to this. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, maybe I'll get some friends that will be the judge of this. And, and this is what I often talk about in terms of the once, as Nietzsche said, once we killed God, we no longer had someone to hold us accountable, even to our own self-described religions, which seem absolutely authentic. And from me, they're from my secret, sacred self. And I've brought it up from the depths. And now here I have it in front of me. And that will help me even though when you read this, it's like, no, this is just kind of the liberationist social justice religion. And you've now articulated it, but you've presented it to these people. And probably most of the people in the conference will say, yeah, that's mine too. Surprise! But having a purpose in isolation is not much use. It's not really ah, enough to back to the sacred canopy problem that Verveke put out. To know what our purpose is, to actually find meaning, we have to find ways to fulfill that purpose. And that means setting goals. It's got to be instantiated. So let's talk about that. So there are lots of different models for goal setting, and most of them make me want to push forks into my eyes. <laughs> so here is what I like to think about. When I'm setting goals, I like to ask myself, does this connect to my purpose? Do I actually care about achieving this goal? Is this a goal that I actually can achieve? And how will I know if I'm making progress? So let's take a quick look at each of these, starting with goals that connect to purpose. Now, as a now, now enough of you who have been around business stuff, because what's really interesting to me is that, so I'm old enough now that when I got back to North America, after working in the Dominican Republic, churches were all excited about this management by um, management by objective and mission statements and goal purpose. I mean, all of this stuff. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with all of this stuff. It just it just is a way to try to organize things and achieve some things. But we don't need to go through this because it's it's pretty it's pretty much there. Okay, we skip a little bit ahead and. But honestly, <clears throat> and I know this is not a particularly sexy take, fuck moonshots. <laughs> moonshots came straight from the capitalism playbook, and I hate them. You don't hate capitalist money because those are all the people that you're taking money from to consult. But anyway, keep going. Just fuck aiming for an unattainable vision. All it does is just wear us down. Oh. Uh... We still have the arenic nihilism problem. We still have the same problem that it all means nothing in the end. In other words, I, I tried to sort of ramp up from the secret sacred self to build up, but am I ever really going to rid the world of negative emotion? And I'll again cite this Freddy de Boer, who is a real communist. I mean, I'm not citing some conservative here. This is this person is probably Freddy de Boer is probably significantly to the left of Amy Hoop, if that's how to say her name. 
Um, and he's written a book. And basically what he realized is that um, therapeutic maximalism is a disaster. Wanting and not getting is disoriented and kind of an identity crime. Human, human life is meant to be spent in ceaseless state of feeling valid, which is to say affirmed and respected and paid attention to and liked. Any deviation from this state is pathologically um, and a vestige of injustice. In other words, the way this whole thing is set up in terms of I don't want anybody to have to experience the kinds of negative emotions that I experienced as a child so we are going to make the world safe from negative emotions. And Freddie DeBoer rightly says, can't be done. In fact, you don't want it to be done. And the irony is that the people who on one hand ostensibly want to rid the world of negative emotions, the way they try to pursue this is by causing negative emotions in the list of people that they think are the enemies to their project. In other words, their project themselves are causing negative emotions in their enemies and adversaries. But what they say is, it is justifiable to cause negative emotions in my enemies and adversaries because they are the ones who are causing negative emotions in others. In other words, it's just one big circle of hurting one another. And then the Augustinians walk in and say, tell me about it. That's the way the world is, isn't it? And the thing about setting achievable goals is that you actually get to feel a sense of achievement rather than thinking about all the things that you didn't manage to do. I am not interested in setting a trap for myself to fall into and burning myself out in the process. I think you've already succeeded in this, but go on. An example of this that I genuinely wrote down at the start of the year was to write a book about how design systems contribute to systemic harm. So and again, the, the, the vagueness of this systemic harm. Name something in this world that is not attached to a system or isn't itself a system. And then harm, go back to the Freddie DeVore piece. Casual. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, and, you know, and, and write a book? Who's going to read it? I mean, how many people read books? Yeah, actually, what you've done here on a video is probably a step ahead of the book because 1,600 people read uh, or 1,600 views on the video so far. That's something, and I'll give it a, you know, more people will watch it because I'm giving it some attention. This is actually something that I want to do. It's a subject that I feel really, really passionately about, and it is actually... Ah, uh, but isn't that how we got here? You used to feel passionate about tech. Now you're going to write a book, and you're going to feel passionate about that. But remember, there is no more divine judge, and if there's no more divine judge who is holding everybody accountable, there's also no more of a divine judge to, to satisfy and to feel satisfied by satisfying him. Irrelevant to my purpose. But if I expand on the question slightly to ask, is this the goal I can actually achieve given my current resources, time and energy? The answer is absolutely fucking not. And, and what's ironic here is that ostensibly the goal will save the world. Otherwise, there's no point in pursuing the goal to write said book. But she can't really afford to write the book that will save the world. Okay. Darn capitalism. The fact is that I just do not have the bandwidth right and now. And the nervous laughter in the audience basically says, yeah, we agree. Now to write a book. I'm way too burnt out. And I know that all it would do is make me feel like a failure. And so instead... Because I just, chances are probably no one would read it. So she's going to reduce her goals. I decided to make a podcast about it. This was a much more attainable way for me to... A podcast? What's that? There's, I've never heard of a podcast. There's like nobody out there making podcasts trying to save the world, are they? Explore and communicate about this subject. And I only went and bloody did it. It's called Systems of Harm. And if you don't mind me doing a very quick shameless plug, it's available now on all good podcasting platforms. Well, I feel better now. It's that little bit of negative emotion has been relieved of the world. I've never heard of her podcast. Have any of you ever heard of her podcast? Has, do any of these one episodes sort of 
But again, this is the meaning thing because if I make the podcast, I can just imagine that this this little episode will just turn the great wheel of the universe just a little bit more the great arc of history now at least we have the sacred canopy we have meaning this this should be meaningful um and the nice thing about this goal is that it was very very specific and measurable so i set out to make and publish a podcast and i did it i wonder if she's made more than i have and that links to my final I wonder if she'd like to compete on numbers of podcasts. I've probably got a 2,300 podcast lead already. Or consideration, which is how will I know if I'm making progress? Again, so, the lack of a transcendent divine judge. Not all goals are as finite and specific as making a podcast. Sometimes we just want to deepen our knowledge about a subject or we want to develop new skills in a certain area. And these kind of goals can be harder to measure, but it's so important that we can see that we're making progress because not doing so is a recipe for burnout. And I'll explain why. So the term burnout was first coined by Herbert Freudenberger in 1975, and it was characterized by these three components. The first one was emotional exhaustion. So the fatigue that comes from caring too much for too long. So nihilism helps with that. Then there is depersonalization, which is the depletion of empathy, caring, and compassion. And finally, we have a decreased sense of accomplishment. So this unconquerable sense of futility and a feeling that nothing we do is ever enough. This is practically the definition of depression. And it's this third component that makes it so important for us to support our goals with progress markers. Because if we don't, we are just running on a treadmill and taking actions without any sense of really moving forward. And this leaves us with no sense of satisfaction or reward. And that's what burns us out. So what have we learned? The combination of a core purpose and goals that help us to fulfill that purpose and a way of measuring our progress is what gives our work meaning. But there is, so, I mean, it's pretty much what Jordan Peterson has said. There's a really important caveat to this. And that is that these, this is only true if those things come from within us and not from other people or institutions. Secret, sacred self. Because again, Charles Taylor, you can't navigate by the stars anymore. You have to navigate by your inner lights. But then there's like 100 years of psychology out there that says, well, where did these come from? Did they come from your parents? Did they come from your childhood experiences? Did they come from your community? Why does everyone in the room have the same ones if they're all just unique and way down deep inside special to me? Because they never came from the inside. They didn't. They came, I got flying here. They came where everyone else's came from. You all got them together. We cannot rely on external resources, uh, sources, sorry, to tell us what matters or whether or not we're moving in the right direction. And this leads me into the last. So byproduct of the turn in, you are alone. And, and the irony, of course, is that you can't work with anybody. If you're an animal of one, nobody knows your language. Nobody, nobody, there, there's, 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 you are disconnected from the rest of the world. This is practically a, this is practically a recipe for solipsism. Thing that I want to talk about today, which is disconnecting from external validation. So a really hard and painful. Well, don't look at the social medias with the thumbs up and the clicks and the likes and all of those. And you know what's going to happen at the any 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 guess what's going to happen at the end of this presentation? Have you ever been to a conference and someone does a presentation and? What does everyone do after the presentation? And when they come up to the speaker afterwards, they say, I'm not going to say anything to you because you made it quite clear you've disconnected from any kind of external validation. And then walk away. Is that going to happen? I don't think so. The painful realization that I've come to this year is that I have relied far too much on other people to give me a sense of myself. You mean like money? 
I have needed recognition and praise and acknowledgement to make me feel valid and successful. And I have done... And we all do. And that might be a clue to something. C.S. Lewis could take that and say, hmm, that's very curious that we all have this. And of course, someone might say, oh, that's just built up in evolutionarily. Okay, yeah, yeah. But why is it there in the first place? Why, why do we feel a sense of mission and meaning and purpose when we satisfy another higher than ourselves? Some things I didn't really want to do or care about in pursuit of other people's approval. And one way I discovered this was by becoming self-employed. So as I mentioned, I stopped working in-house nearly four years ago now. And it's only recently, in light of this kind of burning out existential crisis, grumpy cat vibe, that I've begun to realise how much my sense of purpose and my progress has historically come from corporate career progression frameworks. And yet, you're giving a talk at a conference in a trade show, about to receive applause, probably have more clicks, and you're going to check up on it. I don't know if anybody will tell you about this video, and if so, you might be a little... And I mean, I mean, if you want to come on the channel and talk, more than happy to. And I, anybody will tell you, I'll be as gentle as a kitten with you. I really will. But on the ideas, I'm going to be hard. Because this idea, I don't need external validation. Again, I mentioned this other podcast. Listen to David Perel. It's probably about her age. Very business oriented. Uh, one of the things he picked up when he picked up Christianity is audience of one. Now, why is audience of one superior to what she's trotting out here? Because actually you need it both ways. You can't, you can't have audience capture because then you're just captured by the zeitgeist. You can't say, I don't need external validation. Well, how will you know if you're doing the right thing or on the right track? Well, I'm just going to guide from my sacred secret self. Nope, not big enough. Stars, we navigate by stars. So audience of one actually means the audience of one, of course, is God. And, well, God is very tricky because God is holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of his glory. And so it actually is both. That's part of the reason it works. And I'm going to be completely removed from the validation of others. Uh, good luck with that. It ain't going to work. Without someone else telling me that I'm exceeding expectations or acknowledging my work with a pay rise or a bonus or changing my job title to move me up the ranks of some professional hierarchy that someone else has decided, how do I know if I'm doing a good job? And even though I moved away from this in quite an absolute way, I think this is a helpful question for all of us to ask, because if our only sense of validation comes from our employers giving us pay rises and promotions and good performance reviews, then the absence or removal of those things is guaranteed to leave us feeling invalid. And I'm not saying that these things aren't important, because they are, right? We all need money to live, and we all need feedback and positive reinforcement, and that's dread capitalism normal but it's a question of how much power we want to give to them if we make these things the sole metrics against which we measure our success and the things that we allow to motivate us then we're putting our sense of self-worth entirely into the hands of something that could be taken away and that leaves us in quite a vulnerable position and this wasn't the only way that I was overvaluing external validation she says to you from a stage. <laughs> um, so, like a lot of us, I expect, I was using social media to give me a sense of validation. In particular, Twitter. I beg your pardon, X. <laughs> or nowadays, X, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Threads, unless we forget how we've all gone crawling back to LinkedIn. <laughs> Of all the abhorrent things that Elon Musk has done, the way that he has forced me to re-engage with LinkedIn is something I will never forgive him for. <laughs> now, I used to share a lot of my work on Twitter, chasing the dopamine hit. Wait, 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 wait. What, what was that external validation thing? Didn't we all sort of knowingly laugh together? Didn't that feel good? 
of likes and comments and engagement to make me feel successful. And the recent fragmentation of the social media landscape has really highlighted how flimsy it all is. If validating ourselves with corporate gold stars puts us in a precarious position, then looking to social media to give us a sense of self-worth is even more risky because, as we've seen, it can so easily be taken away. So again, we have to ask ourselves, how do I know if I'm doing well, if I'm not collecting likes? Because the other thing about using social media engagement or other types of external validation as a means of motivation or a measure of success is that it is a race to the bottom. It will never really feel like enough. Am I happier now with 10,000 followers on Twitter than I was when I had 10? Or when a tweet gets 100 likes instead of three? Not really. Again, go back to the meaning thing because once my goal is to get 10,000 followers on Twitter. I remember when my goal was to get a thousand followers on Twitter. That never really was a goal. But when you get to, oh, wow, I've got 10,000 followers on Twitter. But and again, this is Peterson's point, and he's right. It's the reaching, it's not the holding. Really, honestly, I have become desensitized to it. So it takes more and more to make me happy. And it has been designed that way, right? It, if it could be completed, then we wouldn't keep going back. And so it keeps us on this kind of. And and she sort of blames Twitter for that. But again, it goes a lot deeper. It goes into this mechanism of meaning, which makes itself again, that mechanism of meaning can't be the sumum bonum. A hedonic treadmill. And it is, to put it bluntly, it's an unwinnable game designed to make us feel shitter the more that we play. And it is the poison that promises to be the antidote. Having said all of that, I want to acknowledge that we will never completely stop needing external validation. We are a social species and we need each other and we need acknowledgement from time to time. We all need that. Good. Glad you realized that. Now I'm glad you're saying it, but it still leaves the problem that you laid out. But to cultivate true meaning, we have to answer to ourselves first and foremost. So. Where does all of this leave us? How do I cultivate a sense of meaning now, if not from other people's approval? I ask myself a few questions. Am I fulfilling my purpose? Is what I'm doing day to day making the kind of difference that I want to make in the world? See, and what's interesting about this is, having said everything she's said, I don't think this sentence works because she sort of constructed the whole universe, but then she's given all the caveats and it's like, I, I think it's just sort of what she's left with. She can't not have this, but she's pretty adequately sh laid out why finally it won't work. Am I making progress against my goals? Even if those goals are modest, or even if my steps towards them are minuscule, am I still moving forward? Am I looking a little bit less like this traumatized fox? <laughs> I am getting... See, see, it's, it's, it's still right there. Okay, this is, this is the meaning making. And now what I've sort of done is I've sort of tried to clean the, clean, clean the slate, reconstruct it for myself, but it's functionally the same game because all of those tensions haven't been adequately dealt with. In there, slowly. And most importantly of all, am I enjoying how I'm spending my time? Is how do I feel right now? As you listen to my rough draft, or actually the Sunday sermon I thought was better than the rough draft. The Sunday sermon's usually better than the rough draft, hence it's a rough draft. But the sound quality is never very good for the Sunday sermon. That's partly why I don't often put the Sunday sermon on my channel itself. But if you're curious about it, you can go to the Living Stones channel and you can watch the Sunday sermon. But the goal of sort of this altruistic hedonism in Western culture is, do I feel validated? Do I have positive emotion? Do I maximize that almost all the time? Now notice what has slipped the negative emotions of others. Because finally, if this is the final judge, then... Well, if me having positive emotions comes at the cost of somebody else's negative emotions, sorry, I'll blame capitalism or systemic something, but 
can't help it. I'm not God. In the end, I'm responsible to me. This is sort of the trap of individualism. Is any of those things actually making me happy and inspired and energized and connected to people and all of those things that I want to feel as much as I possibly can? There it is. There it is. So on Sunday we sang When Peace Like a River by Philip P. Bliss. Look it up. Or Rachel Stafford. I mean, just look up the history of the song. I don't know how many of you have seen this show on Netflix. It's called Selling Sunset. And this is... This triggered Grizz enough to <laughs> do a live stream on Saturday, which was hilarious. Most of the cast of the show, it's, it's built around a real estate uh, group in Los Angeles that are selling probably the most high priced real estate you can find even in a state like California. But the cast almost looks like something from a Bond film, complete with sort of these two short bald guys who run the organization. And these are sort of surgically modified spectacle women competing for men, money, fame, attention, how candy is like. You try to take her, and then if you try to, you're kind of like the kids. You don't quite know how you should feel. Now, what's really interesting that in a lot of ways, they sort of exemplify what I think for many in America is kind of a default American religion. It's sort of an altruistic hedonism. Um, what's most important is your current emotional state and that it be the best current emotional state possible all the time. To be happy is to, have, to be the recipient of the best possible situation. To have all of the money, to have all of the beauty, to have all of the pleasure, to have all of the attention and you hope to go from one euphoric state to the next. Again, it And this last point is the most important and is where I want to finish up today. I started this talk by saying that it all means nothing in the end. And in some ways, I still think that that's true. I do hope that I'll get to make a difference during my brief stint on this planet. But one day I am going to die sorry to tell you, and I won't be taking any of it with me. I do believe that the mark that we make matters, so the end matters. And if my, I've made the kind of difference to the things that I want to change by the time that my number's up, then I will die a little bit happier. But the means matter too. How we get there matters. We need to know where we're heading to, and we need to derive meaning from the journey and the destination. And the good news is that we get to decide that. I guess it depends who we is. It all means nothing in the end, but only if you let it. Thank you. Only if you let it. What, what does that mean? So wait, wait, wait. Are we going to have validation? Sort of like branding. Please don't clap. You're validating me. I just told you I don't want validation. You're tempting me with validation, with your applause. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not an improvement. So, yeah. What is an improvement? I don't know. Watch the rest of my videos. Oh, 2,000 plus of them. I didn't make this stuff up. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Should probably wrap it up and say what this video is about again, because I think actually she gave a terrific articulation of the status of 
the liberationist social justice religion as there is. Now, you will find people lighting their hair on fire and doing all things. And she didn't do any of this. This is sort of where it's at in the West, in the public sphere, outside of religions. Because religions, of course, deal with all of these naughty areas that she bumps into. And they've been dealing with those naughty areas for thousands of years because these issues are they're, they're just a function of the way that the world is so again wanted to remind you what this video was about so leave a comment